from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. This is Steve Kilmer at Providential Life and Casualty. Steve, it's been a couple of years. Yeah, I know. Uh, listen, Johnny, how'd you like to attend a wedding? Well, why not, as long as it isn't mine? Yeah, I know what you mean. Oh, you're a bachelor too, huh? Well, I would be if it weren't for a wife, four kids, and a couple of grandchildren. Whoops. Johnny, do you by any chance remember Martha Mayfield Merriman? The old gal down in New York who owns Consolidated Tire and Rubber Company? Yeah, and a half a dozen other companies. Well, sure, one of my old sweethearts. Don't you remember back in 57 when I cleared up that false report of her death? Well, I thought she rigged that herself in order to make a killing in the stock market. Well, of course she did. But Steve, she must be 73 or 4 years old. 74. Well, don't tell me she's getting married again. No, it's her son, Edgar. Oh. But she insists that you be among those present at the ceremony. Well, now, that's kind of funny. I wonder why. Yeah, so do I. And I wonder why she'd have me call you. Unless she anticipates trouble of some kind. Johnny? Uh, okay, Steve. I'll run on down there. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Providential Life and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Shankar Diamond matter. Expense account item 1780, train to New York in a cab to the Brownstone House on Sutton Place. Martha Mayfield Merriman, who looks more like somebody's cute little grandmother than a clever stock market operator, but who thinks and sounds like... Well, judge for yourself. Can you dig that, Johnny? That sprout of mine is finally taking the leap, you sucker. Well, after all, Martha... Say, how about you, Johnny? How about what about me? You know, marriage. Well? Uh, let's change the subject, huh? Turn me down, huh? <laughs> well, then I'll just have to wait a couple of years and try you again. Or has that Betty Lewis been making time with you behind my back? Oh, huh? do you know Betty? No, but I heard the broadcast of that case where she kept you from getting knocked off by that gangster, that uh, curly water. Yeah, Martha, she saved my life. And then didn't have sense enough to get her hooks in you. Johnny, the dames nowadays are really slipping. Just don't you forget, though, that I've got a lead on all of them, because I've already proposed to you. Martha, you are a doll. Sure I am. And if I was a couple of years younger, Johnny, I'd run you ragged. Well, what do you mean, if you were a couple of years younger? Have you forgotten our night on the town after I handled that other case for you? Hey, we really had a ball, didn't we? Oh, boy. It took me nearly a week to recover. Well, then we'll just have to do it again after this wedding's over with. Uh, speaking of which, how would you like a little snort? Larkin! Uh, well, don't you think maybe we'd better... Oh, of course you would. Larkin! Larkin! Are uh, you called, madam? Fine thing, snooping around outside the door, eh? Trying to find out what Johnny Dollar's doing here. Oh, certainly not, madam. Of course you were. Now bring us a couple of drinks. Scotch on the rocks okay, Johnny? Sure, anything. Well, hop to it, Larkin. Oh, and crack the wall safe and bring me the ring. The ring. Uh, very good, madam. No, good old Larkin. He's leaving me, you know, and I'm really going to miss him. Hey, wait a minute, Martha. Larkin has the combination to your wall safe? No, I not. What would he ever do with the junk I keep stashed away in it? Yeah, well, what kind of no. junk? Just some odds and ends and necklaces and brooches and rings, mostly. A couple of bracelets. And what's the ring? The Shankar diamond. What? Isn't that the one I've read about? Mm, probably. The one supposed to be the opposite of the Hope Diamond that's supposed to have good luck charm about it? No, neither. Why, that thing's worth close to a million, isn't it? Well, that's what the insurance company says. And you plan to wear it when your son Edgar gets married? Oh, well, it's silly superstition, I suppose, but maybe it'll bring him and Mary Luann good luck in their marriage. Mary Luann? Mary Luann Melanie Beaufort Exum Culpepper. Sounds like something out of Gone with the Wind. The most gorgeous bail in Greensboro, North Carolina, sir. Oh, is that where the wedding's going to be? And at the old family plantation right outside of town. You're going to escort me to the wedding and the bang-up reception afterward. I understand those southern folks really know how to throw a wingding. Hey, tell me, Martha, do you expect somebody to make a try for that diamond? Well, sure, I always do. Some of the top jewel thieves in the country have tried to snatch that rock. 
Uh-huh. Now, who else knows that you've called me in? No, not a soul. Oh, good. Let's keep it that way. I'm with you. Okay, then. I'll run on back to Hartford and get some clothes to fit the occasion. Johnny, with you and tails and me and a set of threads that Balenciaga socked me a couple of G's for, we're going to knock them dead. <laughs> then I'll come back here. We'll pick up the diamond and go down to Greensboro together. I know. We'll take one of my company planes. Just the two of us, Johnny, with maybe a case of champagne on board. How about that? Martha, we will have us a ball. Fighting <laughs> hell. And if I have that much get up and go when I'm her age, well, I hope she'll live forever. Yeah, the trip to Greensboro sounded like it would really be a ball. But just before I left her, Larkin brought in the Shankar diamond. All 34 carats of it. Flawless. Perfect. Beautiful. And it suddenly occurred to me that somebody who wanted that stone, wanted it really bad, might not hesitate to kill for it. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now for another episode in the life of Sergeant Donald Bellwether, my husband. (sighs) That's what I call a good dinner, Reba. Oh, that was delicious. Well, I'm glad to hear that, dear. More coffee? Uh, yeah, just uh, about a half a cup, please. All right. There you are. Thank you. Now, tell me all about your safety class. Did the boys enjoy your speech? Oh, yeah, they sure did. Thanks to you, I did quite well. My lieutenant complimented me afterwards. Well, good. Yeah, but that same lieutenant threw me a curve, too. How oh, dear. Well, after I gave my talk, he asked the men if there were any questions. <laughs> well, that did it. So one of the guys stood up and said, uh, said, uh, look, Sarge, uh, you claim there were over 95,000 deaths and over 9.5 million people injured in accidents in the U.S. last year. Uh, looks to me like all those safety campaigns and slogans are doing no good at all. Well, how did you answer it? I didn't. I, I couldn't think of an answer. I, I got out of it by saying I'd have more facts and figures at the next meeting. All right. Let's see now. Oh, yeah, here it is. Now, first, Sergeant Bellwether, you start off by telling the boys that since 1913, the accidental death rate has been reduced 35%. Mm-hmm. Or, in other words, if there hadn't been campaigns and safety measures put into effect to reduce accidents, almost a million more people would have been killed in the last 46 years. Hmm, is that right? It certainly is. I'm reading it right out of the National Safety Council record book. Oh, and another thing. Accidents in the farming areas are much higher than in the cities. Now, do you know why? Why? Because in rural areas, there are fewer policemen enforcing safety laws and less traffic signs and signals to guide the motorists. Mm-hmm. You know, many more cars travel the city streets, and yet the per capita rate of accidents is much higher in the rural areas. Of course, the reason is obvious. In the city, more safety measures are instituted and obeyed. (laughs) Reba, you are wonderful. That's a good logical answer. (laughs) I don't know what I'd do without it. Oh, oh, that's my Donald. That's my doll. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Shankar Diamond Matter. Expense account item two, 1650, the trip to Hartford for my formal clothes, then back to New York in the home of Martha Mayfield Merriman. By the time I arrived, she was packed for the trip to Greensboro, North Carolina, and the wedding of her son, Edgar. Her chauffeur drove us to the airport, and then, much to my surprise, took over as pilot of the huge private two-engine plane that was waiting for us. Within a few minutes, we were airborne and on our way. And in my pocket was the ring. The Shankar Diamond. What are you looking so glum about, Johnny? You, Martha. Oh, what are you talking about? I'm the one who ought to have the sour puss. I proposed to you. You turned me down. Martha, I don't think you really level with me. You think I wouldn't marry you, you good-looking... No, no, no. I mean about this diamond. Well, now, Johnny, I don't dig you. Well, if it had been some real serious attempts to steal it before, I would have been warned by the insurance company. Well, so they forgot to tell you, is all. Is it? Or do you have reason to think that somebody's going to try to get it now while you're away from your usual police protection? Yeah, I thought so. 
Okay, Martha. Who? Did you get a look at my chauffeur, Johnny? The laddie who's steering this crate? Well, I could hardly help it. If you mean to say... Yes. Yes, Johnny, I think the only reason Eric ever took a job with me was to get his hands on that diamond. Eric who? Eric Melvin Chatterley. Chatterley? Yes, he's a distant cousin of Larkin, my butler. And Larkin's leaving you shortly. To spend his last days in his beloved England. Did Larkin recommend him to you? No, no. Actually, he didn't even know much about Eric, in spite of their being related. Well, how long has Larkin been with you? Oh, years. And this Eric? Five or six months. Martha, why do you suspect him? Well, now, two reasons. In checking up on him after I hired him, I found out that his old man, Byron Chatterley, is still serving time in an English prison. What for? He was a jewel thief. Sure, sure. I remember reading about him. He was a real expert, painstaking and patient. Spent over three years working on a plan to get hold of the crown jewels. But he didn't plan long enough, and that's when they nabbed him. And if some of the head shrinkers are right, if, if crime is in Eric's blood, well... What was your second reason? Well, about a week ago, I found Eric alone in the study. And I think he was casing the wall safe. But you're not sure? Well, he had a dust cloth, and he started flicking it around, muttering something about giving Lark in a hand, which is highly unlikely. You didn't accuse him? No, no just made it known that I was going to take the diamond with me to the wedding. And I sent for you. Hmm. But if he knows who I am, what my business well, is... I don't see how he can. I beg your pardon, madam. Wait, Johnny. Is there any way he could have been hearing us up there in the pilot's compartment? No, I don't see how. Yes, Eric? We'll land in Greensboro in about five minutes, madam. Thank you, Eric. We'll be ready. Well, Johnny? Martha... The only time you'll have this diamond is at the wedding. And the reception. After all, that's the only chance us old biddies will have to show off our furs and jewelry. Okay, and the reception. The rest of the time, it'll be right here with me. But nobody's to know that. Martha could be wrong, of course. About Eric, I mean. The fact remained that within a few hours, everybody in Greensboro knew about her being there with a the Shankar diamond. The Culpeppers made us comfortable in the old mansion. The suite they gave to Martha was big enough to house a family of 12. During the next 24 hours, the place was, well, I'd call it a kind of dignified madhouse, what with all the preparations for the wedding. There were house guests by the dozens. Some were obviously very wealthy, but some had just as obviously seen better days. And I couldn't help wondering if a couple of them might have designs on that million-dollar diamond. I stayed as close to Martha as possible and at the same time kept a constant watch on Eric. The police who'd been hired for the occasion appointed him as a special guard. Darn fools. They didn't know it, but they were playing right into his hands. If, that is, Martha's suspicions were right. Then, late the following afternoon, the wedding went off without a hitch. The blushing bride was beautiful, and the bridegroom looked appropriately happy. After the ceremony, the ladies all retired to protect themselves in their most fetching gowns and furs and jewels. And finally, about 8 p.m., the big reception got underway. There must have been a couple of hundred people in that ballroom, and the champagne and bourbon flowed like water. Yeah, and I danced with some of the prettiest, most gorgeous girls I've ever seen, right out of Charles of the Ritz. Then, it must have been well after midnight, I caught a glimpse of a shadowy face outside one of the big French windows. As I looked again, it disappeared, but I was sure that it was Eric. I excused myself from Martha, with whom I'd been talking, and, well, that was a mistake. As I reached the window, all the lights suddenly went out, and behind me I heard a scream. It was Martha, no question of it. By the time I fought my way back through the crowd to where I'd left her, the lights came up again. And yeah, there she lay, unconscious on the floor. The Shankar diamond stripped from her finger. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Do you know who said, absolute freedom of the press to discuss public questions is a foundation stone of American liberty? Those words were said by former President Herbert Hoover. Mr. Hoover was well aware of the important role that freedom of the press had played in the creation and growth of the United States of America. He realized that without freedom of the press, no democratic form of government could exist. One of the first steps in the path toward totalitarianism is the creation of a controlled press. A free press hampers the work of a potential dictator. When the press is free, the people of a country are free. When the press is not free, the people of a country are in danger of slavery. Remember the words of Herbert Hoover. 
They are part of your American heritage. Freedom of the press is a foundation stone of American liberty. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Within a few minutes of the time the lights had gone out and Martha had been robbed, we had her upstairs in a suite of doctor in attendance. Fortunately, she'd only fainted from shock and the pain of having the Shankar diamond forcibly stripped from her finger. I acted fast. I had the special police haul Eric Chatterley into Greensboro. Then, after organizing a methodical search of the old mansion, I checked around outside the window where I'd seen Eric's face. And there, sure enough, was a main fuse box where the lights had been turned off. I checked back with Martha to be sure she was okay, then borrowed a car and drove into Greensboro to police headquarters. You all better give us some other reason to hold them on, Mr. Dollar. What do you mean, Chief? My boys went over every stitch on them, but they've found absolutely no sign of that diamond you're talking about. How about his quarters there at the plantation? Now, you know as well as I do, sir, he had no chance to hide anything except on his person. Hey. No, sir, unless you can prove me wrong, we got no reason to hold him. Wait. Where's the nearest hospital? Hospital? Yes. And, Chief, I give you odds I can find that diamond on Eric Chatterley. The X-ray of Chatterley's midsection took a few minutes. Development of the film, a few minutes more. Careful examination of it, only a few seconds. Great day, Mr. Dollar, you were right, sir. Yeah? Was I? Look for yourself. He must have taken it out of the ring. But the important thing, the diamond is sitting right there in the middle of his stomach. The outline of that stone is just as clear. And that's just the trouble, Chief. Uh, trouble, sir? Oh, that's the stone that Eric tore off her finger, all right. So go ahead, hold on to him. But if that's it, sir... But, Chief, that's not the Shankar diamond. All right, Governor, all right. You caught me with the ruddy goods on me, so I'll take the rat for it. And it won't be the first time. <laughs> but you got to admit it was pretty clever of me. Clever? When you couldn't tell the difference between the real thing and a carefully made imitation? Imitation? That's right. The stone that you swallowed. No. He told me she had the real thing. When he got me the job with her. Who, oh, Eric? At least when he wrote me I should come over from England and apply for the... Who, oh, Eric? I've said enough. Yeah? I think you have it that. Eric, have the combination of that wall safe? Of course not. As I told you, the yes, only... Sure, Martha. Well, of course I am. When you say paste, an imitation... Johnny, are you kidding? When's the last time you wore the Shankar diamond? At the big charity ball last spring. If it was the Shank card, not this imitation you're talking about. You haven't had it cleaned or checked by a jeweler since. No, why should I? Then it probably wasn't the Shank car, and you're sure you didn't know about this imitation. Do you think I'd go around flashing a phony? Now, look here, Johnny. I love you dearly, but don't you cool me with a line like that. Don't rile me, boy. Okay, honey, okay. Keep your head on. Just get ready for a quick trip back to New York. As soon as I can find us another flyboy. <laughs> During the flight back to New York, Martha asked a lot of questions, but I sidestepped all of them, promised her a real dramatic ending to the case. And I kind of quietly prayed for one myself. When we reached the old brownstone house on Sutton Place, we told Larkin the butler about the robbery. Then, at my insistence, went upstairs to his quarters on the fourth floor. Uh, here you are, sir. Afraid I don't understand. You've sure got me bugged too, Johnny. Larkin, I see you're already packing for your trip back to dear old England. Uh, yes, sir. During my four years of service with Madam, I find I've accumulated quite a. I beg your pardon, sir. I'm going through every one of these bags of yours, Larkin. Now, Johnny. Maybe even tear them apart to look for false bottoms, hidden compartments. Sir. I'll do the same thing to your clothes, your shoes, if necessary, until I find the Shankar diamond. Mr. Dollar. Madam! Now, Johnny, what's the gag? Sometimes blood will tell. Isn't what that head shrinker said to you? Well, yes, yeah. but I... You were thinking only of Eric, of his relationship with the notorious Byron Chatterley, the man who quietly, patiently spent years working on a plan to get hold of a precious stone. You forgot all about Larkin being related now, to Now, just him. a minute, you... You trusted Larkin, to the point of letting him have the combination of the safe where you kept the Shankar. So he had an imitation made, a beauty... Out of a thing they call stress. Stress? Yeah. It's a highly leaded glass that only an expert can tell from a real diamond when it's cut correctly. That's what you've been wearing the last few times well, I up. just can't believe it. But Larkin realized that sooner or later the fake would be spotted. So he evolved another scheme. To have the fake one stolen by his distant cousin Eric. Same blood, remember? If Eric got away with it, okay. And Larkin was clean. He could split with him later when Eric got wise to the phony. 
If Eric was caught as he was, Larkin's skirts would still be clean. Right, Larkin? Quite, sir. And uh, you won't need to destroy my luggage. I'll fetch you the diamond. Yeah, you may as well. But I must say, if you hadn't discovered the one Eric stole was paste... I'd never have got on to you. May I ask how you did it, sir? Sure. The x-ray of your beloved cousin's belly. Well, I realize, sir, that that's how you located the, the stone. It also told me it wasn't the real one. Well, so help me, Johnny, I don't dig you. We'd never have seen the real one. What? Genuine diamonds are completely transparent to x-rays. So, the diamonds safe and sound, and Larkin and his dearly beloved cousin are in the clink. Martha was a bit upset over what Larkin had done, but, well, she'll get over it. Yeah, and I sure hope I get over this headache. That brawl she threw for me by way of celebration was a dilly. Expense account total, including incidentals, and the trip back to Hartford, call her 50 bucks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Lillian Bayef, Jack Edwards, Barney Phillips, Forrest Lewis, and Eric Snowden. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.